So, so how do businesses use the dimensions you've come up with to really help the business and the HR people in the business make a difference? Let me pick up on the maturity term first and then I'll let Jonathan finish. But, you know, I think by the middle of the 2010s and we, we can all go back, people analytics maturity models were everywhere. We all know the one, they start with basic reporting and they end up with prescriptive analytics or cognitive analytics. And I think maturity models were probably helpful in the early stages of, of people analytics as people became familiar with what it was. And I think uh, certainly I know of practitioners who use them within their organizations to almost describe what analytics is and could be to, to their leaders. Um, but I think we've now reached a stage where they're counter, well, we, we believe that we've reached a stage where they're now counterproductive for people analytics, to be honest with you. Um, if we think about people analytics and we think about maturity models, I think there are a number of deficiencies. They imply that you that it's linear for a start. You must get, you must organise your data and perfect reporting before you can do analytics. And that's not true. Uh, we've seen organisations doing both in parallel. Um, and I think you can, you know, um, and actually you should be doing that in parallel. You continually need to be looking at your dashboards and making sure that they're relevant with, with the business metrics. Um, and indeed, you probably require both if you're going to be tackling a, a big business problem uh, as well. Um, so I don't know, Jonathan, if, you, if you'd like to elaborate on how we've set up the nine dimensions to, to kind of operate in parallel. We've already, you've already talked about that a little bit, but. Yeah, I mean, yes, we've talked about, um, the nine dimensions. I, I think uh, to me, you know, if I, because often, Dave, we get asked this question, you know, where, you know, where, where should we start? What should we do, etc. And of course, you go around the, the, the question and technique. But if I were um, just asking people to think about one thing, I'd probably point them towards chapter eight in the book and say, just read about business outcomes, just read those three case studies, just, and just forget what it is that you've got forget what you're trying to do forget what you've got in terms of tools and raw materials and things like that just think about the business read those three case studies and then then reflect and then you can start at page one if you want to but i, I would say almost jump to chapter eight first and look at that business outcome and say you know what is it that the organizations have done because of this, because I think that gives a really solid foundation for thinking about the, the the art of the possible from an outcome point of view. You know, Jonathan, I really like it. I have your book in front of me for those who are not hearing this visually. And I have the picture that's on the cover. And as you were speaking, I thought, close your eyes and throw a dart. <laughs> Hit one of the nine and get started. But then I love what you said at the end, and I've gone to chapter eight, which I think is really nice business outcomes. And you have three cases, MetLife, Nestle, IBM. I love the idea of an HR person going into a business meeting and saying, as you said, what are we trying to accomplish around here? Both with customers, investors, strategy. And once you get that outcome clear because of, what can we now bring to that discussion? What again, what I love about the book is once you get that conversation, it doesn't matter if you're inside out or outside in because you're connecting them. In this series, we will be speaking to a range of senior leaders who are pushing a data-driven and digital HR agenda. Make sure that you subscribe by your podcast app of choice and also via our YouTube channel for free and regular interviews with the digital HR leaders of the future.